Okay, so uh, I know this is small, I'm sorry, uh, but I tried to fit everything in one blackboard because I needed the rest to write the, the new stuff. So this is, this is what we did yesterday. So we started from a many body Langevin equation for a system of interacting particle, which is supposed to describe uh, a liquid. So we have a, an inertial term, we have a friction term, we have the force that comes from the other particles, and we have a noise. And I said, okay, I will take the overdamped limit just for simplicity, but you can put back this term if you want. So the force is the derivative of the many body potential. So it's a sum of many forces coming from the other particles. And so what I did yesterday was essentially assuming that there are many neighbors, because I, I said in infinite dimensions, in large dimensions, there is a lot of space around the given particle. So in general, you have many neighbors. And, as, and assuming that these neighbors are uncorrelated, which is also related to the fact that they are very far away from each other, then under these two assumptions, I derived an effective process that describes the system, I mean, the many-body system. And, and so there are two effective processes, actually. There is one that is a one-particle effective equation. So this is... Uh, essentially the same, but instead of the many body force, we replaced the many body force by a, a, a frictional force with, with some kernel M, and then a fluctuating force that, that we put together with the noise, with the white noise. So the two terms together form a, a colored noise, and this colored noise has zero mean, and it has um, variance, which is a, a delta function that is the original white noise, and then this delta function is corrected by a, a kernel, M, a colored noise. And this kernel is the same that appears in the friction because I'm assuming that the system is in equilibrium. Uh, I changed a little bit the notation. I introduced this square root of 2 uh, and divided by 2 here, but it's the same uh, story. So this equation holds, uh, holds for uh, one particle and essentially for, for each particle of, in the fluid. Okay? So it's a one representative particle that describes any particle in the, in the fluid. Okay, but then we still need to, to, to find an equation for this kernel. So to do this, we derived uh, an equation for two particles. So now we have two particles that are, that are close, close together. That, uh, and the R of t is the distance between these two particles. And then we wrote an equation for R, which has the same structure of the one for uh, one particle except that if I'm considering two particles, then I have to add explicitly the force between them. So I have the same equation. There is a factor of two because I, I divided by two, uh, but anyway, this is just a convention. Uh, so I have this, um, this equation, and the force here is the gradient of the pair potential. And then I have a self-consistent equation for M, because M is the... In the, in the derivation of the one particle process, just so M was the autocorrelation of the fluctuating force. So it's, it's essentially what is written here, where M is uh, an integral, it's the autocorrelation of the force, which is written as the average, the dynamical average of the force at time t times the, the, I mean the, the initial force at time zero. And then I have to integrate over the initial uh, distance R zero, which is taken from equilibrium. So with G of R, which is the equilibrium distribution of distances. Um, so there you try to sort of identify slow degrees of freedom, which go into your noise. But effectively, what you've done here is all of the interactions and the forces arising, you're casting as a, as a, as a, as a noise term, right? Yeah, a noise because, and a friction. Huh? A noise and a friction. Of course, yeah. No, I mean they, they're, they're Essentially, things. as you do yeah. in Brownian motion. Uh, right. So, uh, I mean, how... I mean, it's not very intuitive that, like, you know, since the forces are coming from particle positions, which is what I'm writing the dynamics for, mm -hmm. that uh, if such a separation 
is meaningful between fast and slow degrees of freedom. It's not very obvious to me how that's happening. No, I'm not, I'm not separating. Fa for the moment, it's not about fast and slow. I, I'm essentially, I'm separating the average force from the fluctuation of the force. There you go. I mean, that... But I, I'm not assuming that... It, I mean, I, I will come back to this in a second. I mean, this, this kernel will have a fast and a slow component. Yeah. But there are, at this stage, I have both of them. Oh, you have both of them. I am not separating. But this is just a... No. You, you, yeah, okay. Wh which term? So this M, uh, I'm not sure I, I got. Mm -hmm. Yes. You mean uh, at zero frequency? I mean, this M will have some. Okay, uh, this is what I'm go going to do next. This M will have a, a zero frequency. Uh, so this will renormalize re the diffusion coefficient. Yes, yes. I'm coming to that. Anyway, so okay, this is the, the question. These are the questions. Uh, so, um, and I wanted to make a few comments on this. But the first is that uh, okay, this is not something very new from the point of view of the, the structure of the questions. I mean, the, these kind of equations have been derived uh, many times in spin glasses, for example. So, um, essentially, this is a, a general. I mean, this kind of structure is what you always find in in mean field systems with, with um, uh, okay, with disorder, but okay, here there is no disorder, but okay, that's, uh, okay, I, I don't want to enter into this discussion. Anyway, I mean, this, this is a, this kind of structure where, where you have a kernel that is determined self-consistently is typical of, of um, disordered systems like spin glasses. The other comment is they wanted to make is that this is also similar to, to the mode coupling uh, structure because, uh, and because, I mean, essentially from this equation for the single particle, uh, um, uh, motion, I can derive, uh, that's easy, and I will not do it, but you, I can derive an equation for the mean square displacement. So the mean square displacement has this kind of, uh, uh, satisfies this equation. And you see that this is very similar to a mode coupling equation, uh, with, with the important difference that in, in mode coupling, this kernel M would be a polynomial in the correlation, would be, for example, C squared, where C is some self, uh, intermediate uh, function. And here instead, M is a bit more complicated because it's, it's determined by this uh, self-consistent equation. But okay, uh, this is just a mathematical difference if you want. Difference if you want. The, last, the, the other thing I wanted to say is that th this equation, so, uh, for, for the specific case of particles in infinite dimensions, were derived by uh, Horg, myself, and, and Thibaut Memburg. Uh, using Pati integrals, but then the derivation I presented was based on a work by Zamel, uh, who did this kind of uh, cavity-like um, derivation where you isolate one particle, you look to the neighborhood and so on. And I think a, a review of both things can be found in this paper that we just posted uh, last month. So it's supposed to be pedagogical, so you can check it. <laughs> yes, we hope it's, uh, it is. And you find both derivations side by side. So you see the path integral version and you see the cavity version. And in principle, should be clear. And also there is the generalization to the out of equilibrium case. So, okay. And the last thing before I move on is that these equations are written in a vectorial form. So these are vectors in D dimensions. And this is really not practical because it, we are assuming, I mean, everything is supposed to work when dimension is large. Okay. You can try to solve these equations in 2D or in 3D, but they will be very bad. I mean, quantitatively bad. Uh, surely they will be not as good as MCT. Um, so the idea is really to use them in large D. And uh, so in large D, it's really not practical to solve for a vector with 10,000 components. So actually what you can do, but I will not do it, but it, you can find it here, um, is that you can essentially project all, you can see that, I mean, uh, as I said yesterday, this force, it's only the longitudinal component of the force along the, 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 the direction of R that matters. And all the transverse directions 
are essentially free and, and satisfy this equation. So you can project everything on the longitudinal motion and you can reduce everything to a one-dimensional equation. And this is exact in the infinite dimensional limit. And it's a simple argument that I don't have time to do, but, but, but it's, you find it in... Yes, but I mean, this will be trivial. Essentially, all the transverse motion will be diffusive. There is nothing... Yes, in this, in this approach, yes. In the infinite dimensional limit. Essentially, you have one direction where you have all the interest, the nonlinear part, and all the transverse direction are just Brownian, essentially. Okay. So, um, now, is that a feature of infinite dimensional yes, yes. systems that you will not have transverse propagating modes at any frequency or or is it is it that's what comes out no i think it's really a feature of the infinite dimensional limit yeah. no because in supercool liquids that's one of the of course, striking yeah. features that you do get transverse i agree modes. so that's right. that's completely missing here. which no missing transverse motion is just diffusion <laughs> okay um now Okay, now let's try to, uh, okay, th that part is for later. So now let's try to analyze a little bit the equations. Um, and I want to show that, that you have a glass transition from, from these equations. So first of all, let's, let's check that there is a liquid phase. So as I said, the, the, the mean square displacement satisfies this equation. And uh, what you can uh, check from this equation is that if m decays to zero at large times, then you have diffusion at large times. So that's the typical shape that you can expect in, the, in a supercooled uh, liquid phase. But even if you are in a, not, I mean, in a dilute liquid, I mean, that, then this would decay quickly. The, the memory would decay, decay quickly, and the uh, mean square displacement would reach the diffusive regime quickly. And you can see that if m decays when t is large. You can self-consistently you can check that, that this uh, admits a diffusive uh, solution because this term will be linear. At la take the large time limit of this. This term is going to become a constant, okay? Because it's the, it's the the derivative of d, and this term is going to become the integral of m. Why? Because when t is large, then if m is short range in time, then t prime should be close to t. But if t prime is close to t and t is large, then it means t prime is large. And if t prime is large, this is a constant. So essentially, you get the diffusion constant here. You get the diffusion constant here times the integral of m. You bring it to the other side, and you divide. And OK, you put all factors correctly, and you find this expression for the diffusion constant. So if m decays to 0 in such a way that this integral is, is finite, so it should decay fast enough that this integral is finite, then the diffusion constant is given by the temperature divided by the friction coefficient. This would be the zero density. This would be the ideal gas limit. You can check that in the ideal gas limit when the density, I mean, the, the memory function has a density in front of it. So if, you, if the density is zero, the memory is zero. So that's the, the, the ideal gas. And then when you switch on the interactions, you have a memory, and this will lower the diffusion coefficient because M in general is positive. <clears throat> And okay, and, th and that's the, the diffus diffusive regime. So you have a diffusive regime, that's fine. But then you see that if the memory, I mean, the, if the memory starts to be long ranged, then this integral will be large and the diffusion will be small. And eventually, when you, you reach a plateau, if the plateau goes to infinity, then the memory becomes infinite. This integral becomes infinite and the diffusion constant vanishes. So, so you get the glass transition. Yeah, so the zero frequency limit essentially controls the diffusion. OK, so I would like to now to derive, uh, so I will assume that there is an infinite plateau now. So let's suppose that we are in a glass now. So I'm, I'm going to do what people do all the time in MCT, and I will assume that this is infinite, and I will derive a self-consistent equation for uh, the plateau. So how do you do that? OK, if this is infinite, then I can write m of t <coughs> as the long time limit plus a fast term. So by the way, this is the derivation in this way is something that, is, that you can find in a paper by Jorge 
Kurz and Letizia Guglielmo and Luca Peliti from 1997, I think. The derivation for these kind of equations that I'm going to reproduce now. So you separate the memory in a plateau plus a fast term. And uh, then, um, okay, the first thing I can do is I can plug this here. And I, I, I assume that the diffusion goes to a constant that I call D. I, I'm not going to put the infinity because I later, uh, otherwise later the notation would be too heavy. So D is the long time limit of D of T. Um, and okay, so what you see is that in the long time limit, this, now in this situation, this term will go to zero. And this term will also uh, go to zero. The argument is similar to, be, to what I said before. I mean, if the time goes to infinity, then here there will be essentially, I mean, t, I mean there is a, a fast part. OK, let, let's write it explicitly. So I will get I will get the fast part. Then here I'm, I'm plugging this here. So then I get minus beta m infinity. And then I have to integrate d dot between 0 and t. So I get d of t minus d of 0. But d of 0 is 0 uh, plus 2 dt. OK? So this, when t goes to infinity, this term goes to 0, because I'm assuming that the mean square displacement is a plateau. And this term also goes to 0 for the same, I mean, for a similar reason as before. So t, when t goes to infinity, this part is short-ranged by, by assumption. So t prime should be close to t. But if t prime is close to t, it means t prime is large. And if t prime is large, now d dot is 0, because I have a plateau. So in the long time limit, I kill this term, I kill this term. So I get 0 equal to this. And then I get that, and this will be d in the long time limit. So I get d equal to 2 dt divided by beta m infinity. OK. So the plateau. Yes, sorry. Um, it's a really bad notation. I know it's a bad notation, but. Uh, I, I cannot find a better one. So d of t is the mean square displacement, d is the long time limit, and this strange d is the diffusion constant. But I will, for, I mean, I will not, the diffusion constant I will be forgotten soon. So I, I, the bad notation will not propagate for, for a long time. So d is really the, the plateau of the mean square displacement. You will see why I need, I need this notation. I mean, I, I'm sorry. Um, so I get. For the moment, I just got the relation between d and the, the, diffu the sorry the, um, the plateau of the mean square displacement and the plateau of the memory function. And now I need an equation for the plateau of the memory function. So how do I derive it? Uh, I, I am going to inject this decomposition into the equation for r. So if I do that, No, I'm assuming that there is a, a, a long time limit and the rest is, is, is short range. I mean, I'm assuming that this is, okay, this by, by definition, this goes to zero at large times, but I'm assuming it, that it does it fast enough that I can, uh, yes, quickly enough that this is in, essentially this, this should be integrable essentially in such a way that I can manipulate the integrals as, as I'm doing. So I don't know, you can think it's exponential or power law with a fast enough power law or something like that. Okay, so if I plug this into the equation for R, uh, what I'm going to get is something like, I don't want to, to, to give all the details, but I want to give you the idea. Um, I get something like, um, I get the fast, I have my fr original friction, then I have a fast term. Then I have a, I'm going to decompose the noise also in a fast part that I call uh, psi fast. Then I have the force, which I write as the gra gradient of V of R of T. And then when I plug the slow part, here I have something like, I, I, I have something like minus beta over two, m infinity, and then I have the integral of r dot that 
gives me R of T minus R0, right? And then I have a, a slow noise. What, what does it mean? I, I mean, I, I, I decompose the, the total noise in two independent terms. So I'm writing that Xi is going to be, I mean, is equal to Xi fast plus Xi infinity. And this is something that I can always do. Uh, this is a Gaussian variable. The autocorrelation, I mean, the, the average is zero and the, and the variance of this variable as a delta term plus m. And m is the sum of a fast term and a slow term. So if I have a Gaussian variable that has a variance, I can always decompose it as two Gaussian variables that are independent. They have zero mean. And they have, so this one will have a variance to, sorry, t delta plus the fast part. And this one will have a variance which will be the slow, the slow part. And you, I mean, if they are independent, decomposing it into parts, yes, yes. And I mean, it, these are Gaussian variables, so I can sum, I mean, the variance of the sum is the sum of the variances, and they, they have zero mean, so, okay. So, they are, I'm assuming they are independent by construction. So now, um, the important point here is that you, you can see that the presence of this uh, infinite memory induces a confining term, because now you can think that this is a fast, so this is a kind of, um, this part plus this part is a kind of thermal bat because you have a friction plus a fast friction, and then here you have a noise that, is, that has the same kernel. So all this is a, is a, is a bat, but the particle is, a, is evolving in a potential, and the potential, you have an effective potential, V effective of R, which is V of R, but then you have additional terms. You have plus beta over 2 times m infinity uh, times this is going to be r of t minus r of 0 square. And this is going to tilt the, uh, sorry, there is no t. I mean, that, that's, OK, so. So oh, the, the slow part of the memory introduces an additional, a, a kind of conservative force that, that changes the potential. And this potential was something like, I don't know, some short range potential. So under this potential, the particle was not confined. So in the original equation, you, you can diffuse away from, from the original uh, point because the potential is zero. But now there is this term that is essentially confining, the, there is a parabolic potential that is confining the particle to stay close to the initial point. So this will block the diffusion. No, I mean, if, if I look at sort of the simple Langevin equation, right, mm -hmm. it will have a term like that, no? Uh, um, because I, I could, I would have a, I would have a, a friction term that, that's, that's proportional to R dot. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, this is an additional term, I understand. It's not the standard friction. So the, the constant part of the, the memory term is like a friction term in the standard language. No, 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 exactly. That's the point. The constant part of the memory, the fast part is behaving like a friction. But the constant part, when you put the constant part here, right. you get the integral of R dot which is R, so it's behaving like a conservative force. It's, it's behaving like a spring. It's behaving like a spring that pulls you, oh, 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 oh. that confines you close to the original. The origin, yeah. So essentially, it means that the me an infinite memory is, is acting like a confining potential, which is reasonable. Yes. It's a vector, yes. This is a scalar product. This one. Yes, so if you take, you see, if you take the gradient of this, the gradient of this is 
is going to be gradient of v, which is this term. Then here you get, sorry, this is going to be beta over 4. So here you get twice the, and then you, and this will give you this tilt. So this is essentially, this is a parabola, and this is a tilt on top of the parabola. Okay. So, so you have a particle that is moving inside this confining potential uh, with a thermal butt. The thermal butt is in equilibrium, so you don't care about the details of the thermal butt, so the fast part is irrelevant. At long times, because now I'm interested in, in, in writing an effective uh, and a self-consistent equation for m infinity. So m infinity from this term, <laughs> let's write it here, m infinity is going to be given by, so it's going to be rho over d, then you have the integral over the initial state, you have the force at the initial point, and then you want to know the average force at very long times. So the average force at very long times will be the average into this effective potential. Okay? And you see that now this effective potential depends on m infinity through this term explicitly and also through this term because xi infinity is a Gaussian variable that has variance m infinity. So, okay, I will not, I, I skip the details, but in the end this will be, here we, you will get a double average. So if you want to have three averages, you have the average over the initial state, then you have the average over the uh, long time with, with, that is in equilibrium with potential V effective and should, it should be normalized. This potential depends also on psi infinity, so I'm sorry, I, I also have to integrate over this noise psi infinity which has, let's write it as a this, this is a Gaussian measure with variance m infinity. And then I have f of uh, r. Anyway, so you have three integrals. An integral over r, an integral over this noise, and an integral over r0. Yes, this is just gradient of v. So once you know the potential, and this g of r is just exponential of this is just exponential of minus beta v. So if I give you the potential, uh, you can compute this thing. And this is going to be a function uh, h of m infinity. So you got the self-consistent equation for the plateau. m infinity is equal to a function of m infinity, and you can solve it by iteration. Sorry? No, no, the potential is, uh, is, is constant. Ah, no, no, okay, sorry, no, this is, uh, this potential is the long time limit. Uh, I'm sorry, I mean, no. Again, so, <laughs> if you assume that there is an infinite plateau, then this, these quantities are really constant. If, if you are not in the glass, and if you have a slow, then you, then these things will be slowly uh, changing in time, and then you can check in the paper of uh, Jorge, Letiz, and Luca, 1997, that they have a long discussion of how you can treat this long time regime, and, uh, and it's, it's interesting, but, but it's, I, I don't have time to <laughs> discuss it. So, I'm sorry. Um, this one? Let's, okay. So what you have to do to compute this average, okay, you have the, the, the first integral over R0, which is, so G of R is exponential of minus beta V in infinity. Then you have the gradient of V, which is the force. And then you have to do this average. So to do this average, you have to average first over the, the noise psi inf infinity. So this is a Gaussian average with, uh, variance m infinity and then you have this and then you have to average over the effective potential given psi infinity the force and this gives you the new 
memory. So this is complicated, I mean, because you have to do three integrals in d dimensions that, that are, uh, yes. Ah, you are right. So I'm assuming, um, if you want, I'm assuming a kind of, I will come back on this point, but I'm assuming, I'm assuming an abstract, if you want, a mathematical setting where I am, I, I am able to construct an equilibrium configuration, even if the system is dynamically arrested. I mean, the Gibbs measure exists. So I'm assuming that the initial state is taken from the Gibbs uh, distribution in equilibrium. And then the initial state is described by the liquid uh, phase. By the, so the thermodynamics, the, the structure of the initial state is given by the uh, G of R of the Gibbs measure, which is E of, of the mine. Yes you, you, yes, you could take something better for G of R. You could take Perkusiewicz, but it, it will, in 3D, this is not going to be better, unfortunately. So, and then I'm assuming that I, 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 I'm studying the equilibrium evolution of this initial equilibrium configuration. So if it, if the, if it turns out that, that this, uh, the dynamics is arrested, then of course my initial assumption is, has to be discussed because, yes, then I, yes then this will be my next uh, discussion. But I, I, I mean, this is exactly what you do also in MCT. I mean, in, in MCT, what you put in the kernel is the equilibrium structure factor. So you are assuming that you are starting in equilibrium somehow, and then you are looking to the time evolution, at least in the basic version of MCT, then there are extensions to out of equilibrium. Okay, so, okay, I was saying this is not very convenient to solve numerically because you have three integrals in d dimensions, but with a little bit of work that I don't discuss because it's just manipulation of Gaussian integrals, you can put it in this form. So now you can forget all this and just keep this. So this is exa exa exactly the same equation, but I'm not writing it in terms of m infinity. I'm, write I'm writing it in terms of d, which is the physical quantity, is the plateau of the mean square displacement, but it's just the inverse of m infinity. And if you express everything in terms of d and you manipulate a little bit, you get this form. So just what is written here, we have this is dimension divided by density, and this is the volume of a sphere in unit, uh, of unit radius in the dimension. And this is equal to a function f1 of d, and temperature, and this function is a, a one-dimensional integral, radial integral, of some function q. Uh, and q is given by this convolution. Q is the convolution of the potential, of the exponential of the potential, with a Gaussian. Now, this is a d-dimensional integral, but it's a convolution, so it, you can write it, for example, in Fourier space as a 1D integral, because both functions are radial, or you can use um, what are called bipolar coordinates. And in, in any case, you can put this uh, in, in the form of a 1D integral with some Bessel function that I don't write. So in the end, this equation is reduced to a, uh, an equation where you have to solve for D. So you have to find the, you have to invert this function. And this function is, you can compute it in terms of two uh, one-dimensional integrals instead of three D-dimensional integrals. So you get an advantage. So now let me erase Yes, I will, uh, let me, I want to raise everything at this point. Uh, yes, let me also discuss it because I didn't. So. So, okay, now I have an equation for the plateau and I want to know if there is any solution to this uh, equation. So you want you want the all the questions that are there on this side? Okay. Yes, yes. So what is the now the point is what is the shape of this function f1 of d? And 
I mean, the function f1 of d is something that you can compute on your laptop in five minutes. I mean, five minutes to write the code and one second to run the code. Uh, and uh, <laughs> if you want, I mean, if you put, if you choose their sphere potential, for example, then this is this exponential of minus beta v is a step function, and uh, you you really, I mean, this convolution you can compute it analytically. It's going to be an error function. So you have an error function, you have to do the logarithm of an error function, the derivative of an error function, you have to do a 1D integral and you get your function f. You can do, if you want, you can try, it's really easy. You can do it with Mathematica, for example, and it will work. So what is the shape of this? Okay, so um, let me first discuss it and then I will copy it. What is the shape of this function f1? So, for example, if you take our spheres, it will not depend on beta, of course, because... Uh, uh, exponential of minus beta v is so as a function of d the function f1 has this shape okay and what you want to do is to solve for the plateau and you want to solve that so you want to solve the equation that okay now i can copy here that is uh, d over rho vd equal to f1 of d and maybe of, of beta if you have a soft potential. So you see that for a given value of density, this will be d over rho vd. And if the density is low, this is big, so you don't have any solution. Fine. So you don't have a dynamical arrest, you are in a liquid phase, the memory is going to decay to zero, and the system is diffused. When you lower the, when you increase the density at fixed temperature, or you can also check that if you change the temperature is the same at fixed density, but let's suppose you compress at fixed temperature or, or you compress our spheres so there is no temperature, this thing will go, will become smaller and smaller until at some point you start to have solutions. So now you have two solutions. Which one you should choose? Okay, uh, I, I will give you later an explanation, but you should always choose the bigger one. Sorry, the, sm the, the smaller plateau. If you want, it's reasonable because you know that the mean square displacement starts at zero, so it will essentially be stuck on the first solution that you find. But anyway, uh, we will come back to this point. And so this will be your solution for the plateau in the arrested phase. And then you see that the, that the, the point where you have the dynamical arrest is the point where you first meet a solution. Uh, so this will be, this will correspond to the dynamical transition. Okay. Uh, it's usually called rho c or rho d depending on the, so rho d is a bit confusing because d is also the dimension, but let's call it rho d if you don't mind because, okay. So rho d will be the, uh, so you see that the question for the capital D is the other D. Okay, let's call it row dyna dynamical. So you see that the, then the equation for the dynamical transition is very simple. You have to find the maximum of the, of the function f1 over d. And this in general will be a function of beta, and for our spheres it will be a, just a number. Okay? The other thing that you answer. Ah, D is the plateau of the mean square displacement. The long time in the glass. So it's the non is the equivalent of the non ergodic parameter of MCT. And you see immediately from this that if you plot D as a function of density, it will have a square root singularity at the transition because here the function F1 is quadratic and essentially rho is the inverse of this function. So it's, it's really as in MCT. And you can show that all the critical behavior of this uh, uh, theory is the same as in MCT. So you have uh, beta regime and alpha regime, power laws, and, and so on. But I, I, mean, I, I would like to skip this because I want to move to the next part. No, the other solution has no, no, it has no meaning. It's, it's an unstable point. I will show you later why it's an unstable point. Um, okay. So, um, 
So I think I'm done with the dynamics. Um, ah, well, okay, just one last uh, uh, thing is that I can, I mean, the shape of this dynamical transition, for example, if you take a model, you can take a model of uh, soft uh, spheres. So you can take a potential of the form V of R equal to epsilon over two times um, R minus L over L, let's say square, times theta of L minus R. So it's a potential, uh, it's a, I think Ludovic will discuss this potential a lot. So it's something like, and I think mo many of you used it. So it's, you have zero repulsion if you are far enough, and otherwise you have an harmonic repulsion. So for this, if you compute this uh, dynamical transition density for this potential, it's going to be something like this. So at, 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 I mean, at, at zero temperature, you will obtain the earth sphere limit. And, uh, and then you will have a line. So here, here it's going to be a liquid, and here it's going to be a glass in equilibrium. So if you start from, if you start from an equilibrium configuration at, at this point and run the dynamics, the dynamics is arrested. And if you start here, the dynamics is diffusive. OK. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, you wrote the, here, you had written the equation for m infinity mm -hmm. as a, as a, you know, in terms I of m infinity yeah. with, so this equation is supposed to represent the same. It's exactly the same. It's right? just, but you have to manipulate it. You don't see it, but I mean, it's a, yeah, no, so that you know. it, I thought I understood the equation in the earlier version, but I'm not able to try. No, I agree. I mean, the, the, the first one is, is nicer because it has a physical uh, right. intuitive me meaning. Right. And this one has no, no physical meaning. Oh, well, it's just the mathematical writing of the same uh, equation. Now, what is, is it? Essentially, you have, you have a, a series of Gaussian integrals, so you can do some of them analytically because they're Gaussian, then you manipulate a little bit and you put it in this form. But there is no physical content in that, it's just... No, but like the Q in terms of, I mean, can, can I sort of make a translation table so I understand <laughs> the solution? Uh, no. Not, not so easy. Really, I mean, I, 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 would, I would need to do really the calculation, but it... Right, really no, 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 yeah. that's... that's uh, you can find all the details in the paper of uh, Zamel 2017. There is an appendix where he does mm -hmm. it. Uh, Okay. Now, the other question uh, I had is, um, I mean, so uh, you, you, I mean, like in MCT in the standard treatments, you solve for the plateau value, mm -hmm. right? But the one sort of interesting difference I see here is that you, you, you solve for the diffusion coefficient mm -hmm. effectively rather than other than that for later, right? I mean, is, is that is that also something that can equally be done as, as easily or that? as easily be done or, or f of q yeah i mean the problem is that in all these approach there is no q because everything is written in terms of very local quantities I, i'm in infinite dimensions everything happens on a scale of one particle and its first neighbors so the dependence on, on q is trivial it's essentially going to be always um oh. sure. exponential of uh, I mean, like, the, 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 if yeah. you want the coherent, uh, the coherent function is always going to be something like exponential of q squared times d of t. You don't have a non-trivial q dependence, self. And also the coherent, by the way. The coherent is going to be equal to the self. There is no coherent motion in fin dimension. Essentially, it's one, pa one particle has so many neighbors that already in the first shell, everything is decorrelated. So all the coherent terms are zero. It's very trivial, I'm sorry, but <laughs> it's mean field in its uh, worst uh, incarnation, if you want. But I ask for a reason which I'll discuss later on okay. uh, in private. But, uh, but what about uh, some quantity like the viscosity? Can you write an equation? So the viscosity can be written because you can write the stress-stress correlation and you can realize that actually in infinite dimension, if you ask, the stress-stress correlation is the same as the force-force correlation. 
And from that, you find that the viscosity is essentially, um, okay, th there is a formula if you it, You have a kind of Stokes, yes, everything is related to that. And no, I'm sorry, no, no, the, the viscosity is related to the, um, I, I had an expression for the diffusion constant and the viscosity, you have a kind of uh, Stokes Einstein relation, but it's not completely Stokes Einstein. It's, uh, okay, it's something like that. So you have that the diffusion times, okay. The diffusion times the viscosity is equal to T times L squared times rho divided by 2D. So if it was Stokes Einstein, it would be a constant. And here it's not as, is, is, uh, sorry, if it was Stokes, I mean, Stokes Einstein would give you that this is a constant. And here it's not a constant, it's proportional to rho. There is a paper we have with Patrick, maybe you are going to show that, where we, we did simulations of uh, viscosity and diffusion for our spheres in dimension up to eight. And in eight, you start to see some kind of linear regime in density, but I am. Anyway, this is supposed to be exact in infinite dimensions. Huh? Yes, it's, it's a bit small, but yeah, and then it, it increases. I don't know if you're going to show the data, but no. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> Okay, anyway, so you, yeah, essentially everything is so local that you, that the viscosity and the diffusion are essentially the same thing in this theory. No, it's, so the, the, the diffusion is going to zero, the viscosity is going to diverge, and the, the product is a constant, so it's really, exactly. Okay, so I think this is more or less the, end of the first part of my lectures and now the second so this is about dynamics but the theme of the school uh, is entropy so i now i want to follow what ludovic was t telling yesterday that, and i want to try to rephrase all of this in terms of uh, some kind of entropy uh, so in terms of thermodynamics so in order to do that uh, i want to introduce uh, what is called um, the state following so, uh, construction or uh, Franz Parisi construction. So the idea is really to try to interpret this dynamical arrest in terms of some um, property of uh, phase space uh, and to constructed a modified thermodynamic formalism that allows you to compute properties of this uh, phase space and to reobtain, essentially to reobtain this equation without using dyna dynamics. Um, so this is due to, okay, this is work that started, I mean, uh, I think in the 90s. Uh, so there is this paper by Franz Parisi, the original paper is from 95. There is also work by Remy Monasson at and the same year that does something very similar, but in a different uh, formalism and uh, that is more adapted to do something else. So to, to do what I want to do, this, this, this one is more, uh, it's easier. Um, so that's what I'm going to discuss. Okay, the, and the idea is very simple. Uh, so the idea is that, okay, we start from an equilibrium configuration. Now I'm going to call the initial configuration Y. So Y is the, is a configuration of all the particles, and it is extracted from equilibrium at temperature Tg and density rho g. Now, I will explain later why I call them this way. So, so suppose that you have the Gibbs measure, uh, exponential of minus beta h, you fix temperature and density to these values, and you are able to extract an equilibrium configuration in some way. Um, then you run the dynamics, starting from this configuration. And I will call uh, x of t the configuration of the dynamics at time t. And I will impose that x of t equals 0 is equal to y. But the dynamics is run at density uh, at temperature t and density rho 
that are not necessarily equal to, to TG and ROG, to the initial. So you can think that I'm preparing the system in some temperature and then instantaneously I quench to another temperature and I run the dynamics. Now, for the density, uh, just a little technical thing is that it's convenient to have the same number of particles and the same volume. Otherwise, it's, I mean, it's hard to write this. So I, I'm assuming that the density is not controlled by volume or number of particles. I keep the volume fixed, the number of particles fixed, and they are both infinite. And the density is controlled by the interaction range. So in the potential, there is a parameter L that is a typical interaction scale. If you change L, it's effectively the same as changing the density. So I'm assuming that temperature and density are both controlled by the potential. So I mean, temperature is the factor beta in the exponential of minus beta V, and density is essentially the factor L that is in V. And so in this way, I can compare directly the configurations. So, okay. And so now, uh, suppose that you start from a, a point that is inside the arrested phase. So here is Tg rho g. This is your initial point. And, and suppose that you quench or compress, but you remain in the dynamically arrested phase. Then, No, exactly. That's, that's to be discussed. Uh, the, I mean, mathematically, it's clear. You extract from the Gibbs measure. Then how to do this in, in practice is, OK, let me answer, because otherwise everybody will be confused. So what I have in mind is that this dynamical arrest is something that does not exist beyond mean field. I mean, the MCT transition. So the idea is, in mean field, in mean field, you can wait an exponential time in n, and eventually you are able to equilibrate inside this region. Fine, but it's not practical. But in real materials, this dynamical transition is just, just a crossover. So you can think that you can equilibrate down uh, here. And um, once you are equilibrated, then you can say, OK, now I do an experiment on a time scale that is short compared to the relaxation time. And then I will be, be effectively confined. There are two other ways to do that. One is swap. And I think Ludovic is going to talk a lot about it. I think you already started yesterday, more or less. Uh, Ludovic is going to discuss this so you can change your dynamics, so you can do some dynamics that is fast and is able to equilibrate, and then you slow it down by killing the swap. Or in, in mean field models, there is also a technique that is called planting. And it, this, I don't have time to discuss it, but it's very interesting for computer science applications in which you, by playing with the, I mean, with the disorder, essentially you, you can construct an equilibrium configuration even when the dynamics is arrested. So there are techniques to do that, but in the context of glasses, what I have in mind is really that I'm, I'm, I'm able to uh, use the activation to go inside the, the arrested region. I'm able to equilibrate, and then at, at this point, I freeze the activation and I stay into a state. So when I, I write, okay, so now let's call d of x and y the mean square displacement between two configurations. So this is going to be. The, the square distance between two configurations. And if I am in the arrested phase, the limit of large times of d of x and t, uh, x of t and y, which is essentially x of zero, this is going to be finite. So as before, it will reach some plateau, okay? And this plateau, I call it dr, um, which means I cannot diffuse away from the original configuration. Now, the other thing that I can do, um, OK, and then this limit t to infinity means t large, but not larger than the relaxation time of the structure, if I am in finite dimension. Then I can also consider the the mean square displacement between a configuration at time tau plus t and another configuration at time tau. And I, I can take the limit of tau going to infinity and the limit of t going to infinity, and I will call this d. Okay? So dr is the, this is the mean square displacement between the initial configuration that was in equilibrium at Tg rho g, and one configuration at long times that is um, at t rho, uh, while d 
is going to be the mean square displacement between two configurations that are both at long times with respect to y, and they are also separated by long time. So the idea is, the idea is this. Yes. Yes. So yes, so the idea is, uh, if you want, yes, I can draw it in this way. I can, the idea is this. I will uh, try to draw, uh, I mean, the idea is that in the dynamically arrested, but I mean, this will come later, but the idea is that in the dynamically arrested phase, I have glass states. So glass states are kind of blobs into the phase space. So this is phase space. So when I select an equilibrium configuration, the equilibrium configuration will fall into one of these states. Okay. And, and then, uh, I change the temperature or the density, and so my state will change a little bit because of the change in temperature. So it's going to become something, I don't know, smaller. That, now the trajectory that starts from here and moves in time is going to sample this state, and it's confined into this state. So the, the R is the distance between a typical, a typical configuration into this state and... Uh, the original one. So this is going to be the R, while D is the typical distance between two independent configurations uh, within the, the state at, temp at uh, T rho. I, I, I think this is impossible to see for most of the... Let's expand. So now I'm zooming on one state. So this is the original state at Tg rho g, and I have a typical configuration inside it. And then I have a new state at T rho, and I have my trajectory. Trajectory is moving, and I have configurations x and another configuration x. And so D, uh, D is essentially the, the size of my state at T rho while dr is the shift with respect to the original configuration. So if, you, if, I start in, if I start in equilibrium at tg rho g and I run the dynamics at the same state point, so if t equal tg and rho equal rho g, then these two quantities are equal because the state is not going to change and y is already a typical configuration, so there is no difference between x and y or x and t and x. So these two quantities, so if T rho is equal to Tg rho g, then D is equal to dr. Okay, and now I want to compute D from some kind of thermodynamic uh, formalism. Uh, no, I can also prepare a state and uh, heat it up. I will, later I will show you phase diagrams. But yeah, as long as I remain in the dynamically arrested region, I can also follow a state. You cannot go, I cannot go too much. No, I cannot go above the dynamical point. But I can start here and I can heat up a little bit my state. And this is something that you do, for example, when you do in vapor deposited glasses, they prepare states that are very low in the landscape and then they follow them on heating, and you see that there is a, um, an overshoot of specific heat, and these are things that you can reproduce in this. I will, I will show examples. Okay, um, so what, what's the idea to, to, to try to get this from thermodynamics? The, okay, you know, in, in, in usual thermodynamics, what you do is, is that you maximize the entropy with the constraint that the energy should be constant, that should, should be fixed no? to some value that you impose. And this gives you the, so you then you introduce temperature that is a Lagrange multiplier coupled to energy and you get the Gibbs measure. So here I can do the same. I can say, okay, I want to maximize the entropy. So let's say I want to maximize the entropy. I want to fix the, the energy or the temperature to some value. And, but I also want to impose that 
my, my, so I'm talking about X now. So I, I suppose I know Y, and I want to maximize the entropy of X under the constraint that it has a fixed uh, energy that corresponds then to this temperature, and also that it has a fixed distance from Y. So I want to fix the energy, and I want to fix that the distance between X and Y should be equal to dr. And then I'm trying to, so I, I, I want to have a Gibbs uh, measure such that more it describes this, this region of phase space. And I'm using the same principle as in equilibrium. Maybe it doesn't work, but I, I can try. So then I, what I get is a, a kind of Gibbs distribution for x that is going to be conditioned on y. And this has the form of exponential of minus beta uh, v. I'm, I'm only looking to the configurational part because, I mean, the momenta are going to be Maxwell, Maxwellian anyway. I mean, I mean, in a classical system, so the momenta are always Maxwellian. So I, I get um, exponential of minus beta v, and then I get, I will get another Lagrange multiplier that I can call lambda, for example, that is going to be coupled to the other uh, constraint. So it's going to be something like this. Okay. And then I have to normalize this by some partition function. So this would be my, my candidate thermodynamic ensemble to describe x given y. OK, I can do that. And then, of course, then I should choose, then I have two free parameters. I should choose beta to fix the energy, but actually I want to fix beta, so I will fix beta and that's it. And then I have to choose lambda to fix this constraint. I can, I mean, it's a little bit easier, but I mean, in the end it's, going, it's completely equivalent, but I, I will instead directly fix d. So I will use, a, so this would be a canonical formulation, but I can choose to put a delta function instead of the exponential and directly fix the distance. And this would be the equivalent of going from a canonical to a macrocanonical ensemble. And we know that in the thermodynamic limit, it will make no difference. And here I will have a partition function that depends on y. Also on dr, yes. I, 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 I will not, uh, also depends on beta uh, and, uh, and rho, but I, okay, I will not write all the arguments because otherwise. So, okay, so that's what I'm going to do. So let's forget the, so my candidate uh, thermodynamic uh, ensemble is this one, but it depends on y. So, okay. Now, from this, I can uh, compute um, a free energy. So the free energy uh, is just that, that is going to be a function of y. OK, let's, I will write the expression of beta and rho. And it's also conditioned on y okay, and delta r. Um, let's, uh, OK, and this is going to be minus t over n times the logarithm of the partition function. Here. Okay? So if you accept, and I will I will try to convince you later, but if you accept that this thermodynamic ensemble describes the state that the dynamics will visit uh, at long times, starting from Y, then this should be the, the associated free energy of this basin. Okay. Uh, okay, now, now the problem is this, that, that everything now depends on y. And this is uh, very uh, annoying, because the problem is that y, so you, what you can think of, I mean, you can think of this as, uh, you can think of y as a kind of pinning potential. So you have your, your reference configuration y, and then your Hamiltonian, I mean, the, the potential for the configuration X is the two-body two potential, I mean, the sum of two-body potentials. But then you have this thing, and this is something like uh, a sum over I of Xi minus Yi square, 
with some lambda in the in the micro, in the canonical formulation that I raised, or I mean, or it's a delta function. So this is giving each particle is uh, as a parabolic potential that is confining it close to the corresponding position in the configuration y. But this is very difficult to handle because it's breaking the tra it's breaking the translational invariance of the problem. I mean, this term is translational invariant, but this is not. And uh, so, for example, if you want to use the video expansion, then you have to use the, uh, I mean, everything is going to be non-translational invariant, and it's really, I mean, in practice, you cannot uh, do anything. So what, what you can do, however, is to say, okay, this is going to be, so why is a random variable? Because it's, it's an equilibrium configuration extracted from a Gibbs uh, measure. So F is also going to be a random variable. And uh, so it will fluctuate. Now, in the thermodynamic limit, you can hope that this is self-averaging, meaning that in the thermodynamic limit, the fluctuations due to the fluctuation of y of this quantity go to zero. And this is typical in problems where you have a disorder. The free energy is usually always self-averaging. And, and y really plays the role of a disorder for x. So we know that in glasses there is no quenched disorder, but there is self-induced disorder, and this why is a way of representing this process of self-inducing the, the disorder. So then, if this is true, then in the thermodynamic limit, you can hope that this, this with probability one, this free energy will, will be equal to the average free energy over y. So the average over y is going to depend on beta and rho. It's going to depend on beta g and rho g, because y is extracted from the equilibrium at this state point, and it's going to depend on, on, uh, on dr. Okay. Now, this quantity is translational invariant, because wh when I average over y, I, um, uh, I restore the, tra the translational invariant. If you want, I am averaging over all possible glasses. And, okay, one particular glass is not translational invariant, but the ensemble of all possible glasses is translational invariant. So this quantity can be computed. Um, so that's what I want to, to, to do. Now, um, Oh, there, is, there is still, a, before I move to how to compute the, this quantity, uh, there is still one problem that is, okay, how do I fix the, the uh, dr? Now, uh, in principle, dr is a dynamical quantity because it's the long time limit of the mean square displacement between x and y. So I should, if I wanted to be precise, I should first solve the, solve the dynamics, compute dr, and then use that value here to get my free energy of my glass. But uh, this is exactly what I don't want to do, uh, because I don't want to, I, I would like to bypass the dynamics and obtain a, a thermodynamic expression for the plateaus. Uh, so what can I do? Okay, I can use, again, a principle of statistical mechanics, which is that the free energy should be a minimum over the free parameters. So I can hope that if I replace, instead of taking the dynamical value here from the dynamics, I take this object for any dr, I plot it as a function of dr. So I plot my f versus dr. And I can hope that it has a minimum. Then if it has a minimum, then this should be the dynamical value. Let's call it I mean, the one selected by the dynamics. Please. As well. Um, now, the. I mean, what you're saying is fine, but I, this, this, uh, what you said about the dynamics as a, an in principle component of the definition is probably not clear. I could, in principle, define this purely as an equilibrium quantity, right? I, I can define this object as, an, uh, as a, an equilibrium quantity. I mean, a modified equilibrium because I have to add, sorry, so Z, you remember Z, I, I, I shouldn't have erased it. Z is the integral over x of e to the minus beta v of x, but we've, on top of that, I have this constraint. That's an so, identity. Yeah, yeah I mean, that, okay. that, that's... Yeah. So, uh, in principle, this, okay, this is a, com is a thermodynamic object with this modification. Oh, okay. It's yeah, a modified yeah. thermodynamic yeah, yeah. object. 
But the problem is that dr is a free parameter in this case. So either I take it from dynamics, but then it's useless to do all this. I mean, I, I could, right. but, but other, otherwise I, I measure this, I, I compute this finger, yeah. measure it as a function of dr. No, but I mean, um, just to, uh, no, I mean, if I now integrate the left-hand side over all d, I recover the full partition function, right? This is a standard Landau free energy, right? Yes, but this is true, but... Uh, In that sense. Yeah, I don't want, okay, fine. This will define a, pro a kind of probability distribution for dr, and it's normalized, yes. So in this sense, yes. But the, what I wanted to stress is that it is not obvious that the minimum of this is also coincides with the dynamics. This is a, if this, I mean, if this is true, it's a strong property of dynamics. It means that dynamics is really not only exploring the, there are two things. One is that dynamics is exploring a basin that can be described as a maximum entropy with, with a constraint. And the constraint is also uh, determined by this minimization. So it's a non-trivial property if it's true. I mean, it is true in field. I, I will show you that in the end you get the same. It's ergodic within a basin, but also that the basin is, okay, yes. Now, um, this is, okay, this object, so if you plot this free energy as a function of dr, this is what is called the Franz Parisi potential that Ludovic already introduced. Yes, just one second, yes. So in connection with the previous question, it's not, it's, it's if we consider uh, the partition function as the probability function for, probability distribution function for dr, and we, we want to, for example, evaluate the, the average value of uh, dr, that, that, that should be most probable value assumed by dr with, with a certain y. Yes, but it will also concentrate, it will also be self-averaging dr. So when in the thermodynamic limit, because the, the mean square displacement is, a, is, an, is an average over all the system, mm -hmm. in, the infin, in the thermodynamic limit, the, R, the, the probability distribution of dr is a delta peak, is a Gaussian with a variance of one over square root of n. Yeah. Maybe I didn't understand you. Okay, 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 okay. No. Okay, okay, we can discuss later. So I, I just, I, I have 10 minutes, maybe I, I would like just to finish this part, which I think is doable, but um, I will maybe speed up a little bit. Um, so, okay, this is the Franz Parisi potential, and, uh, um, and it's the one that was introduced by Ludovic. Uh, the only difference that I'm using here, the mean square displacement, because it's convenient in infinite dimension, and Ludovic was using the overlap, but so you just have to flip the axis. <coughs> I mean, in, in my, this is going to be something like this. And d equal to infinity is the liquid, so it's what Ludovic called q equal to zero. And then, so the plot of Ludovic was flipped on the other way, so it was something like this, because here there was q. But it's the same. So the last thing I would like to say before we stop is how to compute this. And here is where the replica uh, come in. Uh, so, because the problem is that you see that you have to average a log, so y plays the role of a quenched uh, disorder, and the average over y of the free energy is the average of a log. So then you use the replica method. I, I suppose that you all have seen it maybe once, but uh, anyway, it's very simple. It's just that you write the log. You can write it as the limit for s going to zero of ds of x to the power s. Y, I mean, okay, x to the power s is equal to e to the s times the logarithm of x. So if you expand at small s, it's 1 plus s log x plus order s squared. So if you take the derivative with respect to s, you kill the 1 and you get log x plus order s. Then you send s to 0 and you get log x. Fine. And then you 
if you take the average, so if x is a random variable, then the average of log x is going to be the average of the other thing. So that, that's the replica method. And um, so the idea is that we want to do, we want to compute the average over y of this log. So we write in, in the same uh, way. So um, um, okay. So f I will call f g this the average. Um, so it is a function of rho t, rho g, t g, and d r. And uh, so this will be the minus t over n times the limit for s going to zero uh, of the derivative with respect to s of. So I had the logarithm of the partition function. So I, now I have the partition function to the power s. And then I have to average. So the partition function, I get the partition function of y, sorry, partition function of y and dr to the power s. And then I have to average over y, where y is taken in equilibrium with, with temperature Tg. And I will have a partition function Zg, yeah, Z of Tg and rho g. So, okay, this is not very, I mean, written like this, this is, okay, you don't gain much because computing the average of a log or computing the average of a power is the same difficulty, but if the power is an integer, then it's much easier. So, what happens if the power is an integer? So, that then I can, this, if, for example, if, if this is s is equal to two, then I have two partition functions. And so I can write all these objects as an integral over y of exponential of minus beta g v of y. This is first, so outside I have a 1 over z of tg, but this is easy. It's the liquid partition function. Then I have the integral over y, and then I have a product. If s is an integer, I have a product of identical copies that are called replicas of xa of e to the minus beta v of x a times delta of dr minus d of x a y. And a runs from 2 to s plus 1 y. Okay, uh, why I choose to number it like that? Because I want to call this x1. So let me call y x1. So now, as you see, so now I have the partition function of S plus one systems that are, so I have N equal to S plus one copies, but the replica number one is special. So the, the num replica num number one has temperature Tg and density rho G. And the replicas from 2 to s plus to, to n, let's say, which is s plus 1, uh, have temperature t and density rho, and they are coupled, they have a, a constraint between, uh, they have a coupling to replica 1. So if you want to have replica 1 in the middle, and then you have a coupling to all the other replicas. Fine. Um, so this is, um, I mean, if, an, if S is an integer, this is fine because all this thing is translational invariant. So it's a liquid. It's made of molecules, if you want, because you have N, each atom is replicated N times. So in, before you had atoms, now you have molecules made of N atoms. They are coupled by this constraint, which is essentially an harmonic spring that binds the atom together. But everything now is translational invariant because this is, I mean, if I translational invariant not to respect of one replica, but if I translate all the replicas together, then this is translational invariant, this is translational invariant, and this is also translational invariant. Yeah. 
yes, if Tg is equal to T and rho G is equal to rho, then it's essentially Mesar Parisi. And then you have complete symmetry of all the replicas. Otherwise, you have one that is special. Um, so what I'm going to do uh, n uh, tomorrow, I think, in the last lecture, is to sketch the calculation of this, um, uh, of this partition function. Uh, uh, let's call this, so let me call z, so I, I remove the 1 over z, so let me call this z s plus 1, okay? And you can see, if you are able to compute this partition function, then the So the value for s equal to zero is just the liquid uh, partition function. Okay? Because if you put s equal to zero, then you don't have all these parts, so it's just the so it it will be the the, the the denominator that you have here. And then you can show that uh, so if you take the log of z s plus 1, and you divide by n. Then you can expand this log for small s. So when s is equal to 0, this is going to be the partition function of the liquid. So you get minus beta times the liquid free energy at, at temperature Tg, sorry, beta g. And if you develop for small s using uh, this formula, then you see that the, the next term is going to be S times beta times the, gl the, the glass free energy that I want to compute. This is a simple calculation that you can do by yourself. But And then I have order S square. So now what I have to do next time is start from this partition function where I have this liquid made of S plus 1 copies one special and S identical coupled to the first one. I should be able to compute it. And of course, I cannot do it in 3D, but I will do it in infinite dimension using the same um, kind of trick that I used uh, yesterday. So doing the virial expansion, now this is translational invariant, so I, take, I can do the virial expansion, I can cut at the first non-trivial order. So, and then if I'm able to compute this partition function, or I mean better, I mean, if I'm able to compute the free energy associated to, to it, which I can do with the virial uh, thing, then I have to, the next thing I have to do is to, uh, so this will be done for integer s, and then the next step is to do analytic continuation to real s, in such a way that I can expand in power series in s, close to s equal to zero, and then I can extract the object that I want to extract. So the, 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 the thing that we will have to discuss is how to do the analytic continuation to real S. And I will do it in the simplest uh, possible way. Um, and then we can extract this quantity. And from that, uh, we can, um, I, I will show that you can reproduce uh, this equation that we obtained from the dynamics. And then I will show what happens if you so, I mean, I, we will reproduce the equation for the, that we got from the dynamics if we set t equal uh, tg and rho equal to rho g. And then we can study also what happens when we prepare a state in, in equilibrium in some point and we uh, follow it in, a, in another point. And uh, then the last thing I hope I will have time to do is to discuss the complexity, how to compute, how to extract the complexity. But actually, Ludovic already discussed it a little bit. So, you know, once you have this, you know more or less how to extract the complexity. Uh, okay, and that's it for today. Uh, can you write the microcanonical like part partition function for the D again? Because I have a question about that. Ah, sorry, I erased it. This one? So, uh, yeah. If I'm interpreting this correctly, uh, what this means is that you start from a point Y, right? 
eventually you approach a canonical distribution over the point x mm -hmm. as long as your d is uh, dr so, yes, so essentially you take the sphere you take the sphere of all the sphere of size of radius dr around uh, uh, x and you wait so your space if you want your 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 face space is the sphere and you wait with the canonical weight but on so, that sphere yeah but but uh, within so if you're interpreting this as dynamics right you're interpreting this as like uh, x is x is the evolution of y like y, x of 0 is y and x of t eventually approaches dr so in that sense uh, you haven't proved in your dynamics that you actually get a canonical distribution in the region of phase space that you in that cage no i agree i mean this is a strong assumption so i mean in, in equilibrium you have dynamics and you i mean equilibrium dynamics will go to the uh, gibbs distribution and okay you can give many different arguments to I mean, but this is not always true also you, you can have some dynamics that doesn't equilibrate so here I'm, I'm assuming but it's a strong assumption assuming that these dynamics in the dynamically arrested phase in the long time limit is really sampling uh, some sphere around the initial state with a weight proportional to the Gibbs uh, weight no it, it's really not obvious so I, I will have to I, I have to, tomorrow I have to do this calculation and I have to show you that the result is, uh, is the same as the one that I get from the dynamics. And okay, by the way, I should mention that this is not something specific to the infinite dimensional particle problem. It's also true in spin glasses. And of course, there is a lot of work that has been done in spin glasses before where we know that in essentially in all mean field spin glasses, this is correct.